Okay, so today we will be looking a little bit about the um, concepts and just kind of like theory behind character design because this is one of the things you're going to create for me. Um, again, you don't need to worry about um, specifically um, this character that we're going to create. We're just going to do it as a practice run. Um, and then when you have your final assignment, you'll be creating a brand new character and brand new assets. Um, everything will be brand new. So everything we're doing right now is just kind of, you know, getting used to understanding how things work. Um, just as a as an aside, I've been looking at some of the GIFs that are showing up in design practice. Loving it. Good, good, good work here. So character design, um, there's a bunch of like little techniques and things that we need to know before we begin. But essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to get something memorable that works well with the constraints of our game. So if we have a look at this, this is from obviously the first uh, Super Mario's. Um, and it was very constrained by the uh, technical limitations. Can't see screen. Oh. <laughs> You're not screen sharing. Yeah, I always forget. Sorry. That working okay? Yes, sir. Triangles are evil, circles are good, squares are. Yeah, I do sturdy more or dependable more than stubborn. Uh, they can be stubborn, but I'd, I'd use that more. Um, so anyway, let's go back to this. So the the technical limitations at the time are that like um, he could only be 16 pixels high. Uh, there was some memory limitations and the amount of sprite sheets that he could hold. Um, you couldn't even flip stuff at the time, so you did have to double up on the sprite sheet. So you know the the trick we did, we are gonna do. Sorry, is to flip the character. Um, so we just need to do it one one direction of animation and we can just flip it. Um, that wasn't really possible at the time. Um, but even with this, there's loads of little tricks that they still had to use to try and maximize with their very limited kind of like uh, ability what they could show. So there's a number of things here. So first of all, why does he have a mustache? So there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is Mario was based on um, a, a landlord that was Italian, but it's that's the starting point. But it's also easier to distinguish a face. So if you imagine this same thing without the mustache, uh, this would look real strange. Um, let's try. Let's see if we can open up Photoshop real quick. Let's get a screen grab that. Um, and yeah, we'll see that a lot. Every Everything they're doing there is to try and define structures in general. So they're using as, as like as minimal, which this is super minimal, 16 pixels high, as minimal um, a kind of like footmark of, a, of, of pixel usage while trying to maximize what they can get out of it. Just, just wait for Photoshop to open. Uh, but while that's doing, you can see they started with loads of sketches that aren't the, the pixel side. So they just kind of started with like, I kind of want like this sort of look. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get there uh, with the pixels that I have. Come on, go. Okay, let's do new layer. <laughs> So let's imagine. That is, I mean, it works, but uh, <laughs> it just, and like, even if we do something like, uh, maybe let's make the, the nose, that like, we could fix that. We could do something like this, I guess. Do that, make, make we could make the nose smaller, not that big away something like that we could do that uh, but <laughs> just doesn't quite like do you know um, so that's that's one reason so that does help to to define facial structure uh, now the other thing is why do we, why does he have a cap 
His face is way more generic. So the, the mustache allows it to kind of have a distinguishing feature. So the cap is... So if we look here, right? This could be hair. This literally could just be hair. But then what happens? If I have hair, what does hair do when you're jumping around and moving? And it moves. And if you have a limited amount of pixel um, count, we kind of want to not do that. Um, so the hat is one method of having something that doesn't need to be animated. Um, jumper. Why does he have, like, overalls? Obviously because he's a plumber, but, like, what's the other reason for having overalls? Distinguish arm. The entire arm. So the overalls are red. So if I took it away and just made it like, you know, he's wearing pants. Pants and a blue shirt. Oh, target layer is hidden. Let's make a new target layer. Okay, we see that. Now imagine that we have the arm moving in front of the body. It's literally just going to be a hand moving back and forth. We won't even we won't even see what's going on, right? So you can't even see the arm movements. And again, you got to remember this is because of pixel limitations. So there's all sorts of little things that they have to do um, to maximize what they have. Um, and like you can see, they even did things like this little yellow button. It may seem like such a small thing to us, and to us, it's nothing. It's like one pixel. Who cares? This is an extra color. You have to remember this is back in the days so that color was um, expensive. So I have an extra color just for yellow um, here, which they would then use for the coins and stuff like that as well, So and the stars. So they're reusing that color, but it is a conscious decision to have a, a specific standout color. So it's a little, remember the primary, secondary, and the uh, accent color? So there's a, a, a little accent, even in something like this, they could get a little accent in. So now let's have a look at more complex characters. So main characters in particular are, are, are really important because they're kind of what the whole game is based around. As a player, you're the avatar. Do people still remember this? Dual jump. It's not really a thing anymore, I don't think, is it? Um, you have it on your phone, no way. So um, even if... If anyone doesn't know Doodle Jump, right? Like, uh, I mean, first of all, the name gives you a hint. But what would you think this character does? At least you would think it flies. Uh, maybe you wouldn't get that it jumps, but at least that it like moves and it goes up. Yeah, at, at the very minimum goes to up. And we can go up pretty high because it's got a rocket. Uh, it's got four legs, which we don't know if that has a difference or not. It's got like a little nose thing that maybe is to pick up stuff. It's not, but just like, if you didn't know, you would be getting this from that. Now, aside from that though, what else would you get from this in terms of like, Think about who's drawing this. Like a child. Why do we know it's a child? It's a doodle. Um, and also like you see this little scribbles. These are very like kind of kid scribbles. It's like, ooh, like um, I'm drawing fire. Like whenever you see like a kid draw fire, they kind of do these scratchy like lines. That's em emulating that. Um, the... This is obviously not drawn by a child, but that's for visual acuity purposes. But you can see the aesthetic they kind of go for is like a, an outline, a pen or something, and it's colored in with marker maybe. It doesn't even have shading. It's very simple. Uh, the background is a grid that's like a grid paper, uh, dot eyes. It's very simple, like um, as much as it could be. So it's something that a child might draw. It's better than what a child might draw, most children. And when I say children, I mean something like, I don't know, six to eight. It, it probably is better, but it looks, um, it still gives that, evokes that feeling. Yeah, it looks like a copy book, exactly. Uh, which is exactly the vibe they're going for. Um, so how do we start with this? So the first thing we need to figure out is where's the character from? What do they do? What's their job? Um, what's, what's in, like, you know, unique to that character itself? Um... This is from a game called Bastion, uh, and this is a teeny tiny character that, like, I think has about 10 minutes of gameplay time. Well, maybe a bit more. Not a huge amount of gameplay time. It's like a supporting character. Um, yeah, she plays music. But if you didn't know anything about her, what would you think is her job? It's pretty clear. Like, even in the concept art. Uh, maybe poor. Why are we getting poor out of curiosity? 
Got a lot of decoration. Why does the headband give you a poor uh, kind of vibe? I don't, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking. Why do you think that? Okay. So there definitely is... Uh, so here is the concept art. And again, this is like a very minor character. So we associate exactly what James just said. That type of headwear is associated with like peasant classes. Especially if you look in um, old medieval kind of... Uh, like period dramas, if anyone watches them or if you see them on whatever, um, we definitely have that kind of like headwear, uh, the different colored kind of stuff. Uh, we often associate with like uh, nomadic kind of groups in Europe. Um, so this is all based on that kind of like predetermined knowledge and, and kind of like predetermined style that we can um, call upon and we know. Uh, and a part of that is like the, the kind of use of stripes, a lot of ribbons, like flowers in the hair, uh, layered clothing. These are all building on that. Yeah, uh, Esmeralda from Hunchback Notre Dame definitely evokes the same vibes. Like you can almost imagine like the big hue earrings as well, um, which I think are they part? No, they're not part of the, uh, they're not part of the concept. But anyway, we can see from this though. These are these are like concept sketches, um, not really thumbnails, but sometimes people call these thumbnails as well. And we can see that they have a similarity amongst all of them. They know with all of them they want layered clothing. We know there is this motif. See, like that little cog motif. That's like a thing in a, in all of the um, all of the, the entire game. We know we have the stripe motif that they want as well. Which again, that stripe motif shows up in all of the concepts. Because of the background, uh, they know they wanted a headscarf, or more or less they wanted a headscarf. So there's loads of different variations of headscarves with flowers on them. They know that it was going to play like a stringed instrument. So again, loads of different variations in stringed instruments. So they don't know exactly what it is, but the backstory helps them to start kind of like fleshing out this character. Um, if they just started with nothing, um, they wouldn't... You would just be like having looking at a blank page going, I don't know where to start. So having kind of this initial backstory um the character is maybe it's poor maybe comes from this background uh it's a traveling singer maybe um this all helps to give you cues that you can go and research and look up uh what people associate um and that way when we see the final character we kind of get this sense that we don't even consciously understand but we kind of get this like okay i'm I have a pretty good understanding of what this character is and where she comes from. So let's go back to, to even further. Um, and we, we look at how you identify a character. So there's three kind of like levels of very quick, what we call a player acquisition of a character. So how I can see a character um, and identify that character. So it always goes silhouette, color, details. Almost always. Um, there's exceptions, but almost always it goes silhouette, then color, then details. So silhouette is basically literally just the outline of something. right? So if I take something, uh, like shine a bright light behind it, or like just cut it out from the background, make it completely black, that is its silhouette. Um, and the silhouette is should be... Uh, Overwatch does it really well. A lot of, a lot of good like games that are lauded for visual design do it really well so if you can do this you can you should be able to tell the character and who they are just based off the shadow um so if i show you these five this is just a bunch of like random concept art that i got from some some dude's concept art um which is a good silhouette well the resolution shouldn't matter for a silhouette as well unless it gets really bad so middle's pretty good. Four is pretty good. Someone says two is good. Silhouette. So uh, the test that I like to, to tell people to do is to use something called the junk, the junk KR test. So if you imagine like this character is standing on top like a pile of junk and the sun is coming from behind them and shining. Would you be able to pick out their silhouette from all the junk? Number two, I don't think you would be able to. You couldn't tell what's what. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, 
three is quite good. There's a lot of curved lines. Um, humans like curved lines, so curved lines convey grace. Straight lines convey power and strength. Um, so that's maybe why four is a bit good as well. Um, yeah, two is supposed to be a drunk trader, but like, again, there's exceptions. But if I just ask which is a good silhouette, just straight, straight up, which is good and is good for acquisition, two doesn't win, I think. Uh, yeah, so the last one is interesting because there's, there's a lot of characters that are only, they're only like, um, good for silhouette acquisition because of only a couple of small things. And I'll show you a few of those later, but those small things are so distinctive. In this case, the hammerhead, the hammerhead, literally like head shape is so distinctive that it, it becomes quite a big part of the character. So let's move on. Here is again from that Dota art guide, which again, I linked, I talked about, um, last week um who's still playing dota <laughs> okay so what's important from this is um i think some people were talking about it earlier in the chat but there is this concept of circles squares and triangles circles are generally soft um like peaceful like non-combative uh squares are generally like strong dependable sturdy stubborn triangles are generally like sharp poisonous dangerous um, and they don't necessarily mean bad or evil. They're just like what they convey. So if we look at this, there's also another thing, which is stance. And I'll talk about stance a little bit later. And we have this like hero stance. See this person is in a hero stance, like that A pose, um, where the legs are spread apart, like chest is bared, facing straight ahead. That's like a, that's called a hero stance. Uh, weapons are generally sharp because they're weapons. So I think that's, that's something that just generally happens. Um, so a lot of times you can tell whether a character is ev like considered evil or not evil, especially when the morality of the game or the morality of the media that you're looking at is very simplistic. If it's like, ooh, bad, bad people and good people, if it's very simplistic, a lot of times you can tell because the bad people will have lots of like sharp pointy bits, a lot of triangles, their poses will be uh, maybe hunched over, um, a little more like creepy, um, as opposed to standing up straight. There's a lot of these kind of uh, stereotypical. Matt, Matt, yeah, you kind of lagged. Can you uh, go back and tell it again, please? Uh, it's on the recording, so it should be there. But which part did I lag out? Uh, well, that's the problem. <laughs> what do you mean? That's the problem. Uh, I don't know, like the part. What was the last thing I said? After stances. Uh, uh, yeah, no, you were saying you're talking. No, you were talking about uh how uh what's it called how circles convey kind of like roundness, uh, like uh, calming and peaceful that was serenity. Really like far back. Okay, and then squares are like sturdier, and and triangles are sharper and more evil. Did did we go over that? I mean, uh, you you came back. Uh, yeah, we we're we're up to date now. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's it. Okay. Cool. It was only for like a couple seconds. All right. That's all right. I I'm not always paying attention to the chat, by the way. So I am I am flipping back and forth. So I can't see everything at once. Anyway, let's keep going. So here's a bunch of silhouettes, and all of them sh should be, I think, for most people, really, really, really. Um, obvious like vault boy is pretty obvious because of the runny shape but it's specifically this little lick of hair like without that if you just put your thumb over it and cover it it's nowhere near and, and the like thumbs up pose but it's nowhere near as uh, obvious um who's bottom left snake is the mullet and the bandana again if you kind of like cover up the mullet and cover up the bandana it's just like generic soldier dude like, ideally, that's what you want from a good silhouette. That's what you want from a good character silhouette. You should be able to visualize them just based off their silhouette already. Um, Lara Croft, we have the double double pistols. This is OG Lara Croft. Um, double pistols and the braid. It's very obvious. Um, a lot of good visual games. are. I don't think it's her figure. Because if you take away the braid... Um, and take away the double pistols. It's just any generic like lady. 
but there's TF2. Um, TF2 is great for another reason as well. If you look at the stance, the stances kind of also convey what the characters are. So not only is the light character small and skinny and wiry, um, the fast one, but it's, his pose is also like leaning forwards, uh, pushing forwards almost. Um, and whereas the heavy one is like leaning backwards, you can kind of tell they're going to move slowly. Their legs are tiny. They've got a huge upper body, so you can tell they're strong. Um, that is... Someone want to correct Kieran there? That's actually Ganon. Oh, guys, no, it's Ganon. Oh, you're right. Sorry, it's Samus. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Um, so, and then again, we got Kratos, Kratos down the bottom, which like his, if you take away the the blades, um, he would still be recognizable because of that little triangle um, goatee. Without it, again, generic, like, muscle-bound person. So, the reason for showing you this is, like, sometimes even the smallest little thing in a silhouette, if it's distinctive enough, can become um, a, a really clear indicator of what it is. Uh, yeah, but I'd say if you take away the blades. If you take away the blades, it's really just a goatee. So, this doesn't only apply to... To human characters, it can also apply to anything. So it applies to buildings, it applies to like vehicles, anything in the game. Ole, that's kinda it's kinda cursed. So ideally, what a if you've played these games, obviously if you haven't played them, that's different. But if you have played these games, ideally the visual director has done a good job if you can look at all the stuff and understand what it is straight away. If you can if you can go like, oh, I know who that is, then they've done a good job. Like, even a cube, it's distinctive and recognizable, even for something that's just a block, right? Because it's something that a player was doing a lot. So here is Crisis 2. Fairly old game, but what do we think of these silhouettes? These are three different tiers of enemy. Those are three different tiers of enemies. Same faction, to be fair. What do you mean you think they're not silhouettes? What do you think of about their silhouettes? Uh, design works kind of, yeah. It's, it's all right is the, the right way to say it, I think. So they're supposed to be three different tiers, right? So like a uh, generic on the left, uh, kind of like... Um, leader sort of thing in the middle and then like an elite on the right but it's really kind of indistinguishable if I put like a little silhouette over them it's kind of eh they all really look kind of the same um, and you supposed to be able to tell because of the headpiece um, and the headpiece is fairly like um, dis distinguishable but it's not enough so I don't think um, and as it says I think Oshin just said they rely a lot more on smaller details, exactly, um, which is a problem because um, the second part of your sentence is like in the heat of the moment, and that's what a lot of games are, they're Twitch. It's hard to, it's a little harder than usual to do acquisition. I'm not saying it's impossible, of course it's not. So they do have color, they do have like details. Um, you can um, have a different acquisition between them, but it is just not as good as it could be, that's what we're just going to say. Um, this is from Halo, which even to this day is a great example because the silhouettes are super distinctive. You can tell, you can tell like really quickly what you're up against, um, and you and it doesn't show from the picture, but they also have like huge size variations as well. Prometheans is a problem, so if anyone's played, which one's Prometheans? Halo five four. 
Prometheans is a problem, and that's one where I'm like, why did you do that? Because they all look the same except for like some little blobs in their back, um, and they definitely were a step backwards in terms of like design or silhouette at least. Um, it was um, Halo Four where they were introduced, but it's any of the Halo games that was made by Three Four Three. Hmm. I agree. Yeah, Covenant and Flood were very clear. Um, and then Prometheans are just all samey looking. Ah, that's what happens to game studios when all the original people leave. So, how do we create a strong silhouette? The first thing we should do, is, after researching and figuring out what we want our character to be, so in this case it looks like they're kind of doing a lot of stuff about like graceful character, because we can kind of see, um, <clears throat> or at least something that can move quickly. Um, so we see like long slender limbs. This is thumbnailing. Right, so this is just like scribbles, literally just really quick scribbles. Um, and we just want to get like, yeah, I don't know what's up with 19, it's just some random robot in there, that's fine. Um, you're just playing basically with shapes and you're trying to figure out what looks good as a silhouette. Uh, a, I don't know, it says Mark Molnar, 2011. And we want to start with like dominant shapes, bold shapes, and we generally want to start with one or two shapes, probably not too much more. So this is what we were talking about before, where if uh, circles are generally like soft and like, you know, not, not, not very antagonistic, squares are stronger, um, triangles are generally more like uh, volatile, dangerous, that kind of stuff. Um, and you can combine them. So there's a comparison. The star seems more like aggressive and like explosive, dangerous. The circles a lot more like calm and simple and pure. So... How do we see that in games? Here are some examples of games where they've used that circle motif to really convey that the character is very non-threatening, um, relaxing. Like kind of, it should you shouldn't as a as a player you shouldn't feel threatened by this character. Um, Zenyatta is a great one because like even the pose kind of creates a large circle, especially with the arm movements and everything. They kind of stay within a circle as well. Um, yeah like it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not threatening it doesn't mean that they're not powerful or whatever it is in game it just is the perception um, and to be fair to Zen like he is powerful in the in game but he is um, designed to be non-threatening it's like a peaceful character it's like a relaxed character bottom is Spelunky oh no that makes me sad Spelunky 2 is up you can play Spelunky 2 and he is peaceful in lore, exactly. So it's kind of more lore that we're going for, not necessarily like in-game mechanics. Uh, same in Mario, like very peaceful, very calm, very like non-threatening. Then we get Square, and Square is much more like solid, strong, dependable, often military, um, kind of tanky characters are often Square. Um, and you can see that it doesn't necessarily have to be an actual Square Square. Chappie is pretty Square. So you can have curves in there, but it's more like as the more straight lines and the more squares are present in the design, the more dependable and solid and strong. Uh, well, think about what Chappie is as a movie, because they're meant to be scary robots. They're meant to be like these strong, indestructible police robots. Master Chief is pretty square. Uh, well, Bastion was designed to be dependable. Whether or not <laughs> Bastion actually is IRL, it's a different thing. And then we got triangles. So these are like poisonous, dangerous, sharp. Um, these are kind of more things that are like either antagonistic or maybe your friend, but it's kind of like, you know, the friend that's the typical anime like dickhead who doesn't really like get along with the group that kind of stuff their own like lone wolf that's and like anti-heroes will sometimes have them as well um the one on the right is the original diablo uh concept they really wanted to go in that direction but they went for a more like solid heavy bigger stronger diablo but they they did always like it because it was very scary looking it was like creepy and pointy yeah that is hanzo 
So what we can also do is we can mix. Um, and generally, you don't want to mix more than more than two. This gets a bit too mushed up. Um, so like Sonic, for example, is a mix of like circles, uh, but also triangles. So like dangerous, a little dangerous, a little edgy, because it was the it was the nineties or eighties, and everyone was trying to be edgy. So a little edgy, but also um, still soft and dependable. Same thing with Arisa down the bottom, and like uh, Shadow of the Colossus, we got these mix of like a uh, square, so really strong and like dependable, but also circles, so not actually that threatening. Um, which, if you've played the game, no spoilers. Um, same with Circle, uh, sorry, um, uh, Samus in top left. We have um, like a lot of sh sharp points, so they like they can be dangerous, but the sharp points come from the items that the that Samus is using, whereas Samus themselves is like round and you know soft and not very dangerous. It's like they have to, they have to. What do you mean? Who's Link? What kind of what even is a name? Oh, like a chain. I don't see a chain there, but okay. Oh, Link is the bird. I didn't know that. Fair enough. Thanks. Okay. So um, we can also use like simplicity when you do. I don't. I'm not expecting like super complex characters. Um, Bakugo kind of has. I'm just rewinding up to the top. He does have a lot of triangles. A lot of, like, the two gauntlets are huge and circly as well. It's a, you know, it's kind of a nod to the design, I think. Um, so anyway. Um, Nintendo is great at this, of this anthropomorphizing. And it's literally as simple as putting eyes on things. Like, they, they literally make things feel alive by putting eyes on it. It's like, like the bullet bill is like, has eyes in an arm for some reason. Um, and it's just a really quick and easy way we as humans often ascribe, um, it is like an evolutionary trait for us to be able to recognize faces. So we see faces a lot. And that's why like a smiley face is seen by us as a face as well. Um, and a lot of the times, having this kind of almost very simple design can be very appealing. So like Kirby was meant to be a placeholder when, uh, when they designed the game. He was designed just as like a little circly thing they could just get animations and see how it worked um and it turned out people liked it so much that it became the actual main character for the game um and you can see the tree here as well the tree looks anthropomorphized technically it's just a branch with tree holes but it looks anthropomorphized uh yeah it looks soft and cuddly that's the whole point um and here we have an example from animation but it's the same kind of thing where we kind of see like how they started from the basic shapes of what it what a thing should be, and they distilled from that basic shape into what we see in the final movie. Um, so they're trying to they're trying to slowly get um, from from what they think as a shape the character should be represented by, and then how do we continue adding to it until we get a character? Yeah. Uh, so ideally, all processes of character design should follow this. It is neat. But ideally, we should all follow this. So we should always be like, I want to make a character. Where's the character from? What does it do? What what shapes best represent what my character is? And then you're slowly building up from there. Um, so everything should be based off that. And you should have recurring motifs. So let me go back to Zen is a very good example of this. Um, so that. So we look at Zen uh, or Samus. They all have recurring motifs. So it's like circle in the whole body. Circle head. Circle as weapons, circle on the um, chest area, circle sash, um, circle on the little circle, like literally loads of little circles here, circle on the side. So it's all this kind of like, um, uh, kind of like layering the same motif. Again with Samus, we've got like edges of circles here, little curves, circle here, circles there. The whole portrait is literally a sphere. Um, helmet's literally a sphere with little pieces on. We see the same here for this character, triangle for the antlers, triangle the crown, triangle motif, triangle on the, um, the, the sash, triangle on the, the pointy bits of legs and the, on the little ends of the arms and the weapon, the weapon even has a double triangle because it hooks back. So again, you're like trying to, you're trying to layer on, on every little detail, uh, at this recurring motif of whatever it is. 
Samus is not... I, I wouldn't say Samus is meant to be kind of edgy. I don't think so. I, I'd say dependable more than edgy, even though, like, it's... Yeah, kind of. So, and then when we get after that, we can start talking about details, but we get into proportions, and we get into poses. So proportions are, like, basically the relative size of heads and bodies and limbs and stuff to each other. Um, and also, not only, like, within the character, but how they relate to other characters. So here's an example from uh, Disney that kind of shows you size proportions um, of different various characters. So again, first of all, there is that, um, that circle and square and triangle motif happening as well. So if we look at um, Jafar, like it's all rounded off because it's for a cartoon, but triangles, triangles, um, and like the whole thing is like base of that. Um, carpet, dependable, square, and also carpet, so square. The Sultan's like a comic relief, circles and circles. And you can kind of see how they started from that and they slowly moved towards the actual character. Um, genius circle, but also triangly because powerful. But aside from that, we also have this proportions. The Sultan is much smaller because, like, unfortunately, that was like a trope that, like, smaller characters were uh, often like comic relief, especially if they were larger as well. Um, it is a trope, it is a stereotype, it can be damaging, so do be careful. Um, and then taller to convey power as well. Uh, Jafar was like, it's taller than like the same, almost the same eyeline as the genie. Yeah, it is a, it is a trope that still exists. It's not quite as bad as it was. I don't know if people watch like uh, sitcoms from the eighties or the nineties. They were like, some of them were really bad about like uh, body proportions. Um, yeah. Danny DeVito's entire career is based on him, like self, self debasing in some ways. Um, but like he's made a career out of it. I hope, like, I, I think he's happy, but yeah, it is definitely a thing that was, um, and still is, I don't think it's quite as bad these days, uh, but it is definitely something, a stereotype that is, uh, like pulled from the past. Uh, yeah, Danny is a very good actor. Um, and then we kind of have a look at these characters here. These are the main characters and we see that their proportions are same because we kind of want them to be equal, um, or at least like. Uh, equal in terms of how they affect the story. Um, yeah, Kevin Hart as well. He's small and um, he's. So, do be aware of them, um, but it doesn't mean that you have to use them. But they do exist though. Um, so those stereotypes in body proportion that we do have that like, uh, and some of them are based in, um, like literally physiology. So like. Someone who has way broader shoulders and huge biceps will probably beat me in arm wrestling. That's just, you know, that's some, some of that stuff is just what it is. Uh, but you don't have to adhere to these stereotypes. You should be aware of them because you should understand where they come from, but you don't have to adhere from them. Um, so... Where a lot of these stereotypes come from um, are from animation as well. Like, not just animation, but just kind of art in general. So you can kind of see, like... And this is is one of the stereotypes that is not... I, I wouldn't say this is damaging. Um, at least not when used for, like, baby characters. Because they are based on, like, baby proportions. Where, like, you got a huge forehead, a really big head in relation to the body. They're kind of rounded um, in general because they're soft. Like, they have a bit of baby fat. Um, eyes are bigger. These proportions kind of tell you that this is um, a younger, like childlike kind of character. Um, and when I say childlike, I mean like pff, 10 and below. So real small. Um, and then we have like stuff like this where this is kind of like the, uh, as it says, screwball. So like kind of funny character. What's important, but it's like they have an elongated, exaggerated limbs. So they can make like a very exaggerated behaviors and exaggerated kind of motions, which are meant to be kind of funny and like uh, cocky. So these help a lot with that. Um, and then we have like the heavy and look, this is ancient. This is like from, well, not a hundred years ago now, but it's a lot of long time ago. Um, and we have this like barrel chest. So like really broad chest, um, small head area, large jaw. Uh, these stereotypes are still in use to this day. To one extent or another. So like you can kind of see that in like Marcus Phoenix. From Gears of War. He is the 
stereotype of like big heavy and again they try to like move away from that typical stereotype but uh yeah bayonetta is one of the other uh, the other um stereotypes as well which is like that femme fatale stereotype which can also be damaging another thing that bayonetta has is um so most characters male characters if you're looking for realistic proportion um you're about eight heads high uh, for a male proportion more or less around eight heads meaning like if I take your head and like replicate it along the body you're about eight and then um, Bayonetta is like about 12 or 13 which is about ridiculous so it's like overly sexualized this was a trope in the 90s um, in games it still happens especially like Genshin Impact um, this over sexualization trope does happen a lot like uh, there's been a bit of a pushback on it as well in games these days um but i think it affects some developers more than others so here we have a technically should be a stereotypically weak character right so like skinny like tall but quite skinny very gaunt and we say gaunt because we can even see the cheekbones very prominently but we as a player or at least you're not you're supposed to not really feel that afraid and why yeah exactly you're supposed to be a little scared why are you afraid so it's not just the lighting the lighting plays a part of it but they look powerful because they of their pose they're looking directly at the player um they're not breaking eye contact they've got full like body facing the player they're not carrying away and they're standing tall and confidently which means that like you know they have something on you they're not afraid of you so their pose is reflecting something different. So it's not just about the proportions. It's also about the pose that you put them into. Um, it's all, yeah, it's, it's, it's layered. And these are other, this is another different version of like skinny and lithe characters. So if I ask you the speed of this character relative, of these characters, relative to every other gameplay, NPC or whatever. Yeah, I think we get Zumi, right? For pretty much all of them. How do we get Zumi? How do we know? Then, look at the weapons they carry. They're light weapons. Um, they're close range weapons, some of them. So close range meaning they probably move um, fast. Because, you know, if, especially if it's a game world that has guns. Why would you be using a blade? So you got to be, you got to be fast. Uh, the other thing that they probably are is flexible. So if you try to like <laughs> in your bedroom, wherever you are now, literally put yourself into the pose of the first one. It looks easy. It's not because that's an almost 90 degree arm aiming backwards. It's even it's like a typical A pose, but that arm hurts. Um, and then like the crouch of the second character, um, even the third one's crouch is kind of a bit awkward to pull off. Uh, lack of armor is another one. That's right. Um, so you know that they value flexibility and speed. I don't know, Mark. I'm kind of Asian, and it's it's kind of. I I don't sit like the third. You don't talk for. You don't talk for me, Mark. Cancel, Mark, please. Okay, so these. They do show off that they're like um, light, flexible, um, based off the way that they're posing. And then we get like this strong, short uh, proportion. Again, this is a stereotype uh, of like quite uh, durable, right? Usually they're the right could be taken as either, to be honest, I think. Like weak in the sense like weak compared to other characters, but surprisingly durable is probably what I would say. Um, and it's also based off like the viewpoint that the 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 player is is seeing. So I don't know if anyone's played Bioshock. Have you? Is it too old for people? This is Bioshock Two. 
So you can either harvest or adopt. But basically what the game does specifically, not only does it give them like childlike proportions. Um, so remember what we talked about, big head, big eyes, big forehead. So not only, um, yeah, Bioshock is a very interesting philosophically as well as game design wise. To kind of drop down a little bit, like um, they, I would play them still. Uh, two, I definitely think wasn't as strong the design. Um, and then Infinite was very interesting from story perspective, but I'm not sure about the ending, and I'm not sure about the uh, gameplay. I did do a lot of interesting things though to uh, Infinite, uh, if, and one was very interesting for the time. It probably doesn't hold up. I'm not sure if it would, but uh, it was very interesting for the time. So anyway. There are these things, you can either harvest them, you get an instant benefit, or you can adopt them, in which case you don't get a benefit. Uh, but this is where I think the mechanical kind of like design fell down. You got a benefit later on, and it was almost always better. Am I back yet? Okay, you can either harvest them, or you know, that's not too far back. You can harvest them, or you get an instant benefit when you harvest them. Or you adopt and you get a delayed benefit, but the delayed benefit was always better. So it kind of made sense to just adopt. Um, so mechanically, that wasn't as... I would have liked if they played with like the, the morality of a bit more by making some of the adopts maybe not that good. Um, I think I would have liked that um, if you adopt, sometimes it was very good, sometimes it wasn't. Whereas Harvest was like, you always got something. I think that would be more interesting. And we'd see how people worked. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, it just became like either get it now or actually get more later. So it makes sense to always do the good thing. Uh, so it wasn't great. Um, oh, like, I <laughs> thanks for putting spoilers, but like the game is so old. I don't know. Um, yeah, there's some lore stuff. Um, so uh, what it does, though, it not only shows them as like, you know, innocent childlike characters, but it also does this thing where it brings the character the player character right up to them and you look down on them. So you also have this angle view. Um, when you look down on something, it always it's a position of uh, stereotypical strength. You're towering over them. When you look up at something, it's a, it's a position of stereotypical weakness. Uh, they're kind of like looking up, you're looking up at something else. So if someone is standing over you, it's almost as if like they've beat you down and they're looking down on you, that kind of thing, right? It's not, it, it's just a trick that is used a lot in um, visual design. So it's one of the ways that they kind of like presented this choice. So it's not only the proportions, not only their choice, because like they're, 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 sorry, their pose, because they're posing like very innocently. They're like trusting, holding a hand out literally to you, but it's also what they make the player characters see. Yes, in two, you were supposed to be approaching. Well, you were supposed to be. It's weird. Um, and then finally we get sense of scale. So scale, these are exaggerated scales, but obviously in general, uh, large things be stronger, almost always. Large things are the, the, the damage soaks. I'm probably not going to take it down. Normally I probably need to find a weak point. Um, that's the generic kind of like very big thing. Oh, even though, even though some things are not, uh, are not necessarily strong just because they're large. Have you played? Have you played Shadow of the Colossus, Aaron? Ah, okay, you know what happens. Okay, so that's why I was gonna say I f I find Shadow of the Colossus very interesting because the designs are squares and circles. They're not triangles, and we all know what squares and circles mean. Most of them are squares and circles. There's a couple that are kind of triangular, um, but. They're, they're, it's kind of almost as if the visual designers were giving you a hint as to what the story was, even before you find out about it, just through the visuals. Um, I hope that's not too much of a spoiler for like a 20 year old game. Uh, the emulation isn't great now, to be honest. I, I, I would, I would play the HD remake if you can. The emulations, I've played a few that are okay. They're not. They're not great. Yeah, there's a HD remake. Yeah, from like, not that long ago. Yeah, PS4. Is it not on PC? Pretty sure you can get it on PC now. 
I don't think it's on Steam. No. I I'm actually don't know. I actually don't know if it's on PC. Someone tell me. Um, and then like we're definitely seeing much more of this like normal character design, even though it's from Mass Effect Three, which is a long good time ago. But it was, it was if you can believe it, discussed at the time. Oh wow, the female character doesn't have like giant boob armor. Oh well, the male character looks like he might be a normal human, not just like arms made of like railway trucks. Um, it was kind of the start of this kind of like, hey, we're having more realistic, normal proportions and poses and characters. Um, <laughs> Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Okay, uh, so we talked about the repetition. One of the reasons I put up uh, Mass Effect is because a lot of the there's this kind of thing called the Mass Effect curve. So that specific curve shows up in a lot of Mass Effect's armor. Uh, Mass Effect is being re-released and a new Mass Effect is coming. Very happy. Uh, it is nice to see the armor being basically the same. Obviously, there is still a proportional difference, but they're realistic proportional difference. They're not like, um, you know, ridiculous stuff. Um, so this curve is a specific design thing. And every time you see a screenshot, a lot of people would be like, I... I know it's a sci-fi thing, and even though it's kind of generic, I know it's Mass Effect, and I don't know why. And it's because that curve is used a lot, and it's like a... I don't know. I don't think it is. It's just curves. I want to delete that, Gabriel. Um, so it's just like a repeating motif that's used a lot. Just delete it and we won't talk about it again. Um, and then f we have color. So we went from silhouette and we go to color. Uh, so we talked about color already, like the, the main color, the secondary and the, um, whatchamacallit, <laughs> and the accent colors. So we talked about all this stuff, so we don't really need to go through that stuff anymore. But one of the things we can also do is we can also have uh, faction-based colors. So we can, it's, it's a very easy way of saying red faction, blue faction, um, and distinguishing them, um, e as, even if they're the same kind of like overall structure. So if anyone's watched like red v blue um, in Halo, that's another method of uh, distinguishing them. Uh, Horde and Alliance are very different in general. So, like, if we look at WoW, Horde and Alliance are very, like, um, in general have not only color, but they also have, like, uh, the Horde will use a lot more kind of, like, um, triangles and squares, and the Alliance would be a lot more round and squares. You know, like, they're both as squares, but, like, the, they'll use quite a bit more like rounded kind of shapes in the alliance um, so it's it's not just from a color perspective um, and then some characters are literally only differentiated by their accessories but a lot of the time the accessories so the details form part of the silhouette so again we look at a uh, samus to the right the ears are part of it definitely but that could be generic um, elf but uh, the hat specifically, the master sword, master shield, they're like, uh, they're specifically very um, kind of like distinguished, especially the sword. The sword is a very distinguishing silhouette. Um, and the same with uh, Cloud on the left, it's pretty obvious, right? That sword is like literally, without the sword, generic anime person, dude. But with the sword, yep, Cloud. Master sword, Gober. Um, and it's the same kind of thing we were talking about of like the silhouette, uh, sorry, the details of the weapon shows you what they're like. So we get like submachine guns, so it's light, it's fast. We get a sword, light and fast. And then we get this big giant Gatling gun that's almost the same size, probably a slow character, probably really heavy. So this is from Borderlands 2. And then we look at these characters, the clothing themselves and the details of accessorization tell us quite a lot about the characters. So we look at the first one. Um, has anyone not played this game? Okay. 
But anyway, even if you have played the game, you can still kind of break it down. So, left character, what do we think personality-wise? Clumsy? Insane? Why we why we get insane? So the pose, she's like, cr like kind of creepily doing a golem perch. Um, the eyes, huge eyes, open. Um, when you can see the whites of the eyes in a character, if you can see the, um, like a, a lot of the whites of the eyes, it makes a character look crazier. So that when people say crazy eyes, that's what they mean. The eyes super wide open. Um, the smeared ish kind of like eyeshadow as well. So it's not, it's not neatly put on. It's like smeared. It kind of makes him look blear. Um, sorry, my cat did a thing. I don't know if you could hear that. Um, the asymmetry of the clothing as well. So you've got like one. Look at her arms and legs, right? One of them is a shit, a shin bone. Uh, one of them is an arm, arm like a what do you call it? What do you call those things? Arm, arm stocking. I don't know. But like the other one doesn't, so it's asymmetrical. Um, the there's like plasters everywhere, so like they always get into trouble. There's like bits of blood, like they're wearing a mask with blood on, so they're a bit crazy. Um, all these kind of like show you that they're a little bit unhinged, but what also makes you kind of feel a little cutesy? Like pink, again, stereotype. I like wearing pink, but you know, it is a stereotype. Pink, the little ribbon bow, uh, the proportions of the character itself, like a big head and big forehead, again, kind of childlike. So we kind of have these uh, being at play here. Uh, watch is a kid's watch, exactly. Good one. Good notice there. Um, kid's sock as well, that kind of like striped sock to me is a very like American kid's thing. And she she is a child, so she does have child proportions. Um, now, second character. Uh, <laughs> what's her what's their job? Uh, no. I think a chef is correct. She's got a huge ladle. She's carrying behind her back, like. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious, right? You don't even need to like ask what the character does. Everything about like everything. There's little wrenches everywhere. Um, literally everywhere. Carrying a huge wrench, another wrench as a backup, a wrench on the um um um, what do you call it? Belt up top as a, the top one. Little wrenches to the side. More wrenches to the left. So what else do we kind of know about the character um, aside from mechanic? Why grumpy? I mean, a little bit angry face, a little bit. Why do you think she has a loved one? So I would definitely agree with expert at what she does. Um, the reason being like, you can tell it's not just a single wrench. There's loads of little wrenches. There's like, uh, uh, a, a, what you call it? An attention to detail, right? It's like a, the right tool for the right job. So probably good at what they do as well. The patchy overall is a really in, in, good one. So it tells you that they're not one to waste something. They're not going to throw that overall away. It still works. Just need to patch it up. And also I don't really mind if the patch isn't um pretty it doesn't it looks a bit uh mismatched i don't care because it works um the tools are like aligned uh, you can see they're like um um put away very neatly so again like uh like ordered like able to to kind of like know where things are very easily utilitarian is a good one uh rib sleeves and wrenches is very much from like so there's definitely a rosie the riveter vibe if anyone knows that like uh, again, it's a stereotype, which is definitely, I don't know for sure, but I, I can't imagine it's not one of the, uh, what you call it, inspirations. So this is Rosie the Riveter, and it's a bunch of different Rosie the Riveters as well. Uh, yeah, I'd be surprised, but sometimes. 
so you can kind of see the similarities there happening as well even the the the, the face um pose like the no where is the og rosie og rosie is that one and again that huge um like like the the the, the whatever the tool that they're using as well um and the goggles. Do you have goggles? No, no goggles. But you can imagine goggles there. So that kind of that kind of shows you. Um, where did someone say loved one? And then the heart tattoo. Yeah, that would make sense. Okay, and then final character. What are we thinking? So there definitely is an argument here about like um, whether it's over-sexualization or not over-sexualization. And we can have a debate on that. Definitely ask Owen for that. Because in games, I think we're, especially in the past, quite guilty of like overly. But um, we definitely get the unstable, unpredictable angle. Um, so entertainer, because um, if we look at what a ringmaster looks like, she's pretty much wearing a ringmaster clothing. Um the hat, though, it's kind of ringmaster, but it also harks back to, if anyone's read Alice in Wonderland. Um, so if you look at Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, that's the original um, illustration, where it's this huge hat with like stuff in it on the side. And again, if we look at her, huge hat, stuff stuffed in. So all these things always like kind of like um, call back to other media, to other kind of like um, reference other things. And this is why they're used. And it's why it's so important to reference stuff before you. Uh, the huge, hugely overdone makeup is like not only a mask, but also kind of gives you insane clown or uh, Joker kind of vibes as well. Absolutely. Like it's way overdone, the makeup. That's on purpose. And you can kind of tell like she's either hiding something um, or she's a little bit like unhinged because the, the makeup isn't done badly. It's not smeared. So she's not that unhinged. But like you can see there's a little bit of running on the eyes. Um, so maybe a little bit. Um, so all these kind of things kind of hint at it. Um, if you look at the details like the buttons, some one of some of them are missing. Some of them are replaced with a different button. So, you know, like again, maybe a little unpredictable as well. Uh, red definitely has a passionate kind of like, um, uh, what you call it, like meaning, whatever version of passionate. So we can also use uh, details and accessories. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you can tell that it's very worn. All these little bits are also like, you can tell there's stuff that's, uh, actually most of these characters, it's both specalyptic, so it makes sense that all the stuff is worn and not brand new. Uh, but you can kind of tell just based on those touches. So here. We say steampunk, right? How do you know it's steampunk? And what, what time is steampunk? Because it looks like it. That's, yeah, but what tells you it looks like it? So type of clothing, absolutely. So like something like the Industrial Revolution, right? So we are talking about the 1800s. A lot of brass, um, a lot of like decorative, um, decorative mechanic, me like mechanical items so if you remember at the time machines were expensive so in order to put that like to make a machine so you were proud of it and when you made it you kind of made it a little pretty you put like this little filigree at, on the side because it was so expensive um a lot of brass that's right <clears throat> huge kind of joints uh like big links so it's like this is not a time of delicacy this is a time of like functional, uh, we're trying to get things working. So like massive joints, like huge yeah. cylinders. Um, there is absolutely diverse food influence. I specifically know because I, I like, I, this is in one of their GDC videos. Um, they definitely took in diverse suit influences in there. So like the ball joints and all are from diver suits. Um, the feet are from a diver suit as well. So you, and, and that's a very common thing at the time as well, where they would try and paint something to look like it's something it's not. Um, so like you can tell that it's got this huge giant feet, but um, what you call it? The, it? They're painted to look like shoes, right? So they're not like, um, they're not exactly 
<laughs> they're they're like big giant clunky boots, but they're trying to paint them to look like oh nice little loafers. Um, so that that is a very Victorian thing to do as well. Uh, the clothes are in shreds, so you kind of know that it's like um, what does that tell you? Yeah, exposed moving parts definitely gives you that Victorian vibe. And if we look at the hands, um, these are very reminiscent. And this is going to be, you know, trigger warnings, maybe a little creepy. So the prosthetics from that era kind of look like that. And some of them are quite creepy. Um, so you can kind of tell they were trying to go for that kind of vibe. Um, and here you go. There we go. Stuff like that. Um, and even like the facial kind of uh, stuff, there were some facial structures as well that were, um, I think they were scrap. I don't think they have it in this. No, it's not in this one, but they were in other ones. Um, they're big and clunky. They're trying to be delicate because, of, you know, fingers and hands are delicate things, but they're trying to, but they're not getting there. So again, this is like um, trying to, to hopefully get across to you that referencing all these kind of like external stuff is... Uh, is really important so like a, this cage is like one of those breathing cages that they had so um that was one of the other iron lung it's like an we have a much better version but like this kind of like a breathing apparatus so like the bolts and like the kind of slightly transparent thing um people will be put into them so the you can kind of see the influence of here on this like there's an influence on there um, and then we just straight up look at like um, industrial revolution machines in general. We definitely see similarities. Like here's those big, huge joints, the brass, the exposed stuff. Um, kind of like these are like prettier than they need to be. You know, like they've like been carved nicely. Uh, there's little stampings on them. These kind of like extra little stamps. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So all of this stuff goes together to build this. And also like the clothing and like the hairstyle. That's a very Victorian uh, era. Whereas this, this is from Deus Ex Mankind Divided. It's much more modern. Um, and this is like the same thing. Prosthetics, per, human wearing a lot of prosthetics, but much more modern. Um, and like the clothing kind of tells you that. So it's sort of like modern clothing. It's got a hoodie, it's got like a jacket. You could almost see that existing uh, today. But it's different in a way that we're not quite sure what it is. Um, and in this case, it's to do with the asymmetry. So it's very asymmetrical. And also you see that little, very pretty patterning and detail inside it. So one thing that, uh, that Deus Ex did with clothing, they were like, we want the clothing to be modern, like futuristic. So we'll take modern clothing and we'll mix it with Renaissance clothing. And they got, they got something different. And we'll talk about that mixing as well which is right now, when you mix and match two things, you get something new. Um, but you almost always want to take two things that are very distinctive. So this is from Diablo 3, and I'll use this a lot, even though it's old, because it's very good uh, examples. So this is from, yeah, we know it's a monk. How do we know it's a monk? The circle, the little, the beads, the circles... But specifically, let's have a look at this, the sash, the yellow sash. So let's, let's put up the, let's put up my screen next to it. So uh, specifically Shaolin monks. So we can kind of see, look at that kind of robe shape, the sash, the colors as well, uh, the baldness. Now, what else does it come from? Does anyone know the other bit? I'd be surprised if people do. Oh, the the wrapped, uh, the wraps as well actually are very. Um, see there, the wraps. So does anyone know what the second part is, which is like this big, huge. So. Not sure about monk. Definitely. So Orthodox Priest was the second one. So that's where we get the beards. We got the kind of facial structure. We got this like, uh, uh, what do you call them? I don't know what they're called. It's like a little 
slash thing that we're getting here with the it's not a dress it's like a tabard i think i don't know um so and and you see the way they have this like a uh, the the side edge kind of decor you see that happening here as well it's a very interesting combo so the reason why i kind of show this is because they have this rule um which is a 70 30 rule you take 70 percent of one thing 30 percent of another thing and you can kind of tweak those numbers it could be like 80 20 it could be 60 40 but more or less 70 30 right um and you get something new and people kind of know where it's from but they also don't know where it's from so they're like i know that's kind of shaolin monkey but it's different it's not a full shaolin monk so i don't know what it is so it looks new to me even though i understand what it is right and so that's that's uh that's where that combo came from and we see that as well like um and a lot of characters so master chief is like he literally is and this is confirmed a mix between a tank and like uh, medieval armor that's what they wanted so they wanted to take like a, a little bit of like riot armor slightly modern but also medieval kind of like a, a especially fantastical kind of like knight armor mixed with a tank this is our spartans um yeah it's like it is like typical paladin uh it literally is like future tank paladin is what they were going for and they kind of got there um this is from deus ex so um what exactly what i was saying so they took like renaissance kind of features so the patterns the type of clothes so like the ruffles um the kind of like uh these pleats uh quilting they took all of that and then they mix it with modern styles and they get like something that's new you know like you don't you know where it comes from it's not super unfamiliar i know these are dresses but it looks uh not not common right it doesn't look like modern it looks different to what i'm used to so it's interesting so again 70 30 something like that and a, a lot of times even for characters you would draw on like um archetypes that you know of stereotypes that you know of and you combine them for something new so it's not just for visuals uh but like you know the beast characters in halo are literally like you know chewbacca mixed with a barbarian that's literally it uh overwatch again we look at Diana and like the that's the monk there you go there's the nine uh uh head dot things that come from like its clothing comes from Shaolin monks like it's inspired by like zen symbols and like uh symbols of peace uh there's a whole bunch of stuff in there what's a bear joke oh. um also what you want to do is you never want to take the first idea that comes to your head you always want to do iteration this is from mass Effect to a character uh the main character is here that's the final character um so you definitely get like prison vibes because it's a jumpsuit there's loads of tattoos so it's kind of like that jack yeah probably one of the best characters um well no they're all great characters to be fair but you can see the amount of iterations they went through to get to that final character and the reason for this you might be like oh i like the hairstyle from number one but i like the tattoos from number three i like the way the jumpsuit is in number seven um so you know they're all kind of mixed together there is a bad character from mass effect 2 yeah ashley's pretty bad actually yeah ashley's pretty boring uh but you can kind of see how you use that like and the more iteration you do generally the better it is because you'll be very clear that like no i really want the jumpsuit like this because i've tried all these other styles and they all don't look as good yes ashley was even for something like as simple as if anyone's played portal 2 this is something like you barely even see it's so hard to see your own self um but it can be important for the development team themselves when they're designing the game and they're designing how other characters interact with their character um it can be so important because it's like it it changes depending on how you how you like perceive your player character so they went through loads of iterations um for the character themselves and even for like the leg piece even though you barely see this almost never see this whatever you choose uh you again same thing as a. Uh, as for the the art style remember i was saying consistency is most important 
And the same thing when it comes to characters. Consistency is important. These two characters are so different, but you can tell they're from the same game world. Why? They have these same, like, the nose blobs are similar. They have, like, the, you know, the elbow blobs. Uh, their clothing has that same kind of, like, uh, shoulder variation of color. The pieces, there's, like, see this? All these rules? They all follow the same design rules. Um, and that makes it that makes it very easy to to know that things belong together. Uh, even this come from animation, even like little they go down all the way to like little things of like don't break the hood because the hood is part of the silhouette. So try to have animations that don't break the hood because that breaks the silhouette. Um, And it shows you like what you can and can't do. <laughs> um, even things like this, which I never realized until I found this, that when uh, when his hands are on the when his paws are on the floor, they're paws, but when he puts his hands up, they become hands. I never realized that. Um, and then like here, the shine defines the direction of the gaze. So like, all these rules um, do make something clearer. They're much more important for animation because usually it's a whole team making it, uh, but they are um, they are still relevant to us. Like even little things like this, where you know they do like missing teeth because obviously he's a kid, and what do kids do? They have candy, they eat candy. There's no dentist exists in this world, so what's gonna happen? It's gonna be missing some teeth. Like he lives in a like right next to a literal candy kingdom, so it's definitely not gonna. And just things like this where they're like. Because the character is meant to be so um, round and square, everything is supposed to be like soft, but also like dependable. They never want to break that softness. So even like on the sides of the mouth, they're like, oh, try to curve it off, never have hard edges, always round everything off. Like even stuff like this, don't do this, round it off, always round it off. So they're trying to keep that like rule um, going. This is from a game called Fistful of Duckies by Pocket Change Games. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, and it, it's interesting depending on the... Uh, there's a reason why some people will look at um, uh, certain pieces of media and be like, oh, this makes me happy. Like pastel is one of the, the, the tricks for that. Pastel colors is a make people happy trick. Uh, rounded stuff is a make people happy trick. Smiles everywhere is a make people happy trick. Um, so here are some other art rules from here where they're like they're talking always about like having things 3D, um, having things always curved, always tapered, so they go from um, small to large. So all these rooks, rules, sorry, rooks, these rules that you can take, you don't have to make those rules yourself. You can just, you, all you need to do is research what other people did and pull it back to yourself. Smiles everywhere with teeth is a creepy vibe. Smiles everywhere with like anthropomorphic two dots and a smile. That Nintendo does that all the time. They've got eyes and everything, the clouds of eyes. And then think you can have also different, uh, a nice thing to do is have different color palettes where you're like, these can be used for scenery, these can be used for targets. So they're using the opposite. Pastels are for the targets to shoot. Okay. Um, and then the other thing we can do as well to really sell the game world, and Hollow Knight's very good at this, we have this recurring motif. So everyone has this kind of skull colored uh, heads um, they all have like pointy bits to them um, they are like black like deep set eyes even though they're different types of eyes but they're all black and hollow like you know it gives you that sense of hollowness again um, it's very simple but aesthetically very clear right, so they all kind of follow the same rules if I see a character that has that white head and a black eye I'm like I'm like I can probably bet that it's going to be Hollow Knight. Um, and all the limbs are kind of skinny, except for the main character, are like skinny and pointy and small. Yeah. So here's a bunch of useful stuff. I'll post up this later anyway, so you can have a look at that. Uh, but it's a bunch of little things that you can search that help a lot. Um, so we don't have to go in this in depth. This is like how you would design a full character for 3D especially. 
but we definitely need to be starting from basic shapes and iterating from them to try and create like a new character. Um, so if anyone's watched Steven Universe, you can kind of see the same thing happening, uh, where like this character is all triangles and triangles and triangles. That's like round and triangles. There's round and triangles, square, some triangles in there. Uh, like they they may curve off the edges because again they're trying to go for this like wholesome vibe, um, and again they're also using pastels, um, so those tricks that I mentioned. But they are um, they are yeah they're all slightly different. It's it's interesting, but you can tell that they're all the same character because they still follow the same vibes, um, but the rules are the same for for all of them. So what I need you to do. Uh, it is, oof, it is 4.30. Okay, so we're not going to be able to get too much done today. What I want you to do today is just think of, like, the backstory of your character. Um, where is it going to be coming from? What is it? Is it going to be what kind of, like, shapes are the dominant shapes? It doesn't have to be two. It can just be one. So you can be, like, uh, uh, if I'm making a very happy, soft, and safe character, I'll be using a lot of rounds, for example. And you're going to be thinking of that um, again, don't stress too much about it. This is a practice character. And then we're going to design this character on Friday, meaning on Friday with the tutors, you are going to be um, sketching loads of different thumbnails to, yes, the character for the games that you've been doing. Sketch loads of different thumbnails of how you want it to look. Now remember, you have a limitation because you are making a character for games. So you probably want to keep the character fitting within one unit size of your game because it has to fit within that one unit size you probably want to you're going to make the character 2d so you may want to make like the head a little bit bigger maybe the proportions should be something like mario proportions as opposed to something like uh um mass Effect or something like that because mario proportions are going to be a lot more um what you call it um uh, uh, like visible from from far away right whereas something like mass effect you're right up in front of the character so definitely do be thinking about stuff like that um, and what you're gonna actually create is there any questions before we finish up today i'm gonna stop recording